So what's going on guys? Welcome back to Carrasco Ranch. My name is Robert. This is your first time tuning in. So in this video, we're gonna go over some pond management that I do here for the pond. Um, right now it is currently the dead of winter. It doesn't feel like it today, but um, we had a really, really bad uh, freeze down in the teens, killed off everything. But um, I'm just basically gonna go over how I manage the pond, how I manage it to, to keep the fish growing, um, to keep a blue catfish population going, also a redfish population going in the pond as well. So stay tuned. Really, really quickly, got some new um, koozies made for our business, Geodomes of South Texas. Um, so definitely check it out. The links will be down below. Uh, for those of y'all who are looking to go out as couples and just kind of get away from everything, it's gonna be perfect. Um, but yeah, so without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and get into it. So one of the first things is gonna be um, making sure the depth is correct. If you don't have a pond that is at the correct depth for what you are trying to accomplish, um, you know, your, your, your foundation is already flawed and it's probably not gonna do as well. So here we basically have it dropping off slowly. Um, towards the end of the pond, it's about six to eight feet, depending on the water level. Uh, but typically it's at least six feet at minimum. Um, it does fluctuate. If it does flood, then it may get, one year we had, <laughs> this was before we did all this, but one year it did flood all in here. And I did paddle out to the middle of the, of the pond and it was about 10 feet. So you had about two feet of water outside the banks over here. But that was a rare occasion. But typically it's about six to eight feet is what we keep the pond at. Um, so the next thing that's going to kind of be necessary aside from your depth is going to be making sure you have the correct um, bottom layer of either clay or a lining, whatever you have to do for your area. I've seen a lot of ponds that just look really murky, um, like cattle, cattle, cattle ponds, whatever you want to call them. One, you have the cattle running in there. Two, they're not, they're kind of shallow. They're not that deep. Um, so it gets kind of murky. Um, but that's going to be another thing also is just getting the right clay, getting the right clay for your pond. Um, it'll also affect the clarity and the, and the color of the, of the pond itself. So right now the pond isn't dyed. This is what it just naturally looks like. Um, but there will be times when I will dye it and it'll turn like a nice pretty blue. Um, but the next thing is going to be also if you have cattle, if you have cattle in your property and you want it to just look aesthetically pleasing all year round, you're gonna have to block it off. Obviously, you're gonna have to provide water for your cattle some other way, but if you want it to look aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing, you're gonna have to block off the pond because if not cattle weigh a lot, they're gonna start smushing off the banks and the edges. Um, you're gonna get a lot of runoff, um, sometimes fertilizers from neighboring you know, uh, fields or whatever. Um, and it doesn't look as good. It's gonna get murky, it's gonna get nasty. All that dirt's gonna start filling into the pond and eventually you're gonna have to dig it back out. Um, so the next thing you're going to want to check is basically, this is all before you even put fish in here. Um, you're going to want to make sure they have a good oxygen level in the tank um, or in the pond. If you don't have enough oxygen circulating through the water, um, the fish just aren't going to live. Um, there's DO meters you can buy. You can also have a professional come out here and test the water for you. Um, for the most part, um, your water is usually going to be okay. It's gonna be where you have really, really still water, um, kind of like in the back of a corner where there's just no wind, no no nothing, it's just kind of dead. And you'll kind of get the feeling here, you know, you get kind of get the wind blowing over the water. You can kind of see that the water kind of moves a little bit with the with the wind. Um, that just creates more oxygen in the, in the uh, uh, water itself. There's also specific plants that will um, take away oxygen or either put in oxygen to the water. Um, I'll leave that to the professionals. You can go in there and do your own research on that. Um, but I know once you do kill like a lot of weeds, like if you have a lot of algae and you kill it and it stays in the water, it will deplete the oxygen level from the pond itself. So just keep an eye on that. So again, this is going to be one of those other things you want to do before you start putting in your sport fish is going to start getting the algae taken care of. So um, I don't know if you guys may or may not know this. I don't think I ever made a video on it. Maybe I did. I don't remember. But before we dug out the pond, um, it was, this is when I first kind of got the property. When I, when we first had it, it was just covered in algae. Like there was, it was nasty. Um, it did not look like this. I'll tell you that right off the bat. There was algae everywhere. Um, you couldn't throw any kind of line in there to try to fish it because it would just get stuck with all this crap that was in there. Um, 
but one of the first things that we did start doing was we threw in a triploid carp or grass carp as they're commonly called. Um, you do need a permit for those. So you're going to need to apply through, I believe it's Texas Parks and Wildlife is where I applied. Um, and they will give you a specific amount of carp on that permit for the size of your pond. So you will have to know the area of your pond, the, how big it is um, before you go and apply. Once you do apply, they'll give you a permit and you can go to any kind of fishery um, that has those carp and you can go and pick up a couple carp. So what the carp are gonna do is they're gonna get a lot of the rooted um, algae that grows around the edges of your ponds. There's different types of grasses you need to take care of. So um, you don't wanna overdo it with the carp as well because they will start making holes around the edges and they'll kind of destroy the banks if you aren't too careful. Um, but yeah, so those carp, we only put, I don't remember how many put in here, I think maybe five, three or three or five, something like that. We didn't put too many, um, but they've done a great job of taking care of all the weeds and stuff that grow on the edges. Um, as you can see, it's pretty clean for the most part. Um, the next thing is gonna be, you're gonna have that floating algae that just floats in the middle of the ponds. It's the nasty looking one. It has like scum looking stuff on there. So for those, to cover those, to cover that algae, uh, we put in uh, tilapia. We put in a bunch of tilapia. The thing with those, um, well, they will take care of it. So usually at night, you'll hear those things just like sucking. That's all you hear at night. And all it is is just the tilapia um, eating all the scum off the, the pond and eating all the algae that is floating. Um, they have a lot of babies, tell you right now. We put, I don't know, probably about 100 or so in there. And before we knew it, we had probably like 300 of them. Uh, they multiply like crazy. But I will tell you, you may have to restock these depending on your location. So they do not like really, really cold water. So once it's gets really, really cold, um, you're going to have to restock them because usually they'll die off. So you're going to have to get some more. I believe it was 2019, 2020. When we had that big freeze here in Texas, all of my freaking tilapia died. They were all just frozen. Well, the lake kind of froze in certain areas. They were just frozen in the ice. So, um, yeah, we had to restock those. Um, I know a couple did make it. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how they got away with it, but I know a couple did make it from that freeze. But just a heads up, if it gets really cold in your area, you're more than likely going to have to replace them um, every year. So if you just don't want to go out and spend the money to buy these types of fish, there are chemicals to take care of the algae if you don't want to use a fish. So I've actually tried the chemical when I first got this pond. I actually ended up killing off a couple of my fish. So I decided just to go with, you know, bringing in more fish that will take care of the problem for me. Um, again, this is when I was still trying to balance what the heck I'm doing here. So just FYI, you're going to have to be a little bit more careful with the chemicals if you go the chemical route versus um, putting in natural fish. Um, so that's something you're going to want to take, in, take care of before you put fish in here because, again, that will deplete the oxygen level, having too much algae in the pond, and it'll kill off all your fish. Um, so the next one we take care of, being in Texas, we get some big mosquitoes out here. This isn't necessarily a must but it's definitely nice, especially in the hotter months when you have a lot of mosquitoes or after rain events, you're gonna have a lot of mosquitoes. What we put in here is called mosquito eaters. That's their real name, but we call them minnows. Most people call them minnows. They're about yay big. I would say about the size of my clicker as far as in length, not as wide, but it's about as, that, that, uh, that long. And what they do, their mouths are kind of curved up. So they kind of catch the larvae and the mosquitoes that sit on the pond. So we don't really have a mosquito problem because we have so many of those things in here and they reproduce just so rapidly. I mean, you look and you'll see like thousands of these little ones that are just being born. So they kind of take care of the problem for mosquitoes. If you want to have a comfortable fishing area, you definitely want to put those in there. They, take, they do a really good job, honestly. Um, most of these we picked up in little creeks and we've thrown them in here. We actually didn't go out and buy these. I think I put like maybe 50 or 100 and now we have thousands of them. So they just multiply. Um, and like I said, they look like little minnows. Look them up if you are planning on get, buying some or just finding some. Look them up, so make sure you put in the right fish. Um, but yeah, they will take care of the mosquitoes. We haven't had any issues with mosquitoes um, as far as standing water goes. As long as 
the mosquitoes go to the pond, they'll get eaten. So, so by this point, you're probably just ready to put some fish in there, which now you probably can. That's pretty much around the time we uh, got the fish in here and kind of took care of everything. Uh, we did do a little trial run with some small fish. That's when I killed some, when I put the chemical. Um, but we didn't bring in the actual, which if you don't know the channel, um, we put some trophy fish in here. We didn't put the trophy fish right away. We had a little trial run with some smaller fish just to see how they do. And then once we got everything kind of, all the kinks worked out, then we actually really stocked the pond the way we wanted to stock it. So just FYI, you could also do the same thing. Just do a little trial run, make sure that the water is good with some less expensive, smaller fish, see how they do. If they do well, then you can go out and actually stock it the way you want to stock it. Um, but yeah, so um, after that, you're pretty much ready to get the fish in there. One thing you're going to want to do is get some good high quality protein food for your game species. You also don't want to overfeed it because if you overfeed them, all that uneaten food will sink down to the bottom and it'll create like a muck. That muck will also deplete oxygen out of the tank. Um, again, this is going to take probably years to build up, but over time, if it, you're just consistently overfeeding them, you will end up creating a lot of muck and depleting the oxygen level in your pond. Um, so one important thing that I didn't even mention, um, just kind of, I don't know, just crossed my mind, is you're going to want to make sure you can have a water supply to the pond. Um, if it doesn't hold water or you don't get rain, one or the other, in our case, we don't get a whole lot of rain, um, you're, going to have a, you're going to need a way to supply water for the pond. If not, it's going to dry out. So make sure you consider drilling a well. Um, for this one, I think we're getting about 20 to 30 gallons per minute. 30, 20 to 30 gallons per minute. Um, on our well to supply water for this thing. So just to kind of give you a reference of where you need to be at for this size. Um, this one's just under an acre, give or take, um, again, depending on the water levels as well. Uh, but yeah, thought I mentioned that because I totally forgot. So that's pretty much most of what, you, what it takes to kind of get the pond ready for stocking. Um, but just some other quick tips is gonna be, you know, you can also dye the pond during you know, hotter months. So that way the, the light doesn't penetrate down to the bottom um, because when the light penetrates down from, um, from the water and goes down to the bottom, if you have really, really clear water, you're gonna get a lot more algae growth. But if you dye it, um, it creates like a, a barrier. The light cannot penetrate down to the soil um, below the pond, which will prevent weed growth. So that's another little trick that you could use. Um, again, the carp and the tilapia will help take care of all that. Um, one thing we do have here is pollen. We have a lot of pollen that kind of just forms on top, usually around March, um, because the trees start pollinating. The only really way to get rid of that would be to knock out all of these trees that pollinate that way. Um, but again, that's not, you know, something I really want to do, but that's the only problem we do have, you know, being how we have set up with a lot of trees around the pond. So just consider that, um, if you're going to get, uh, trees that are heavy pollinators, um, that release a lot of pollen, you may get a lot of like a film of pollen, usually for about a month, maybe two months max. Um, again, that's just something that I've experienced and it's just something I kind of live with because I'm not going to knock down all these trees. I will also use the dye that I use for the pond um, during the summer months. I do dye it just because it does look pretty as well. Um, so I'll leave it down below as well. So that's going to be my quick guide to kind of gear you in the right direction to kind of get your pond ready for stocking. Again, there's multiple ways to do things, but this is just how we went about, went about and got the pond ready for our stocking. Um, I hope it was helpful. Hope it provided some value to you um, and kind of helped in some way. Um, if it did, definitely give this a like, definitely share, definitely subscribe. And uh, yeah, if you want to see more content like this, definitely let me know down in the comments. Um, but without further ado, guys, appreciate you guys watching. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Until next time, be careful, be good, take care, and God bless. I'll see you guys later. And don't forget to check out Geodomes of South Texas. Until next time, bye-bye.